Tyler Fauvel's statue of Francis Pegamagabo, located outside the Stocky Center in Perry Sound, has been inspiring people for several years and is an amazing tribute to him. Many come to pay homage to this great hero and to ponder how his ideals and bravery affect our lives. However, it is a statue. It does not move, and one must go to it. On one of my visits, it came to me that his story needed to be spread and that it should be done with words and music. At first, the idea seemed too big for the Festival of the Sound to do, but it would just not go away. And thus we started. One could say it was meant to be. I had this really extraordinary dream and it was like a dream, wartime dream, about Francis in the war. And it, it was very, very real, very vivid. Uh, the imagery, the, the sounds, the feelings, that uh, was even like raining in the dream. And, and, and I'm not, I don't really consider myself a, a dreamer, so to speak. But this one was very powerful and very strong. And it was kind of like, you know, our great uncles and aunts would say, it was kind of one of those Indian dreams you pay attention to. So I tried to, but one of the things about that dream was um, it was like wartime, it was somewhere in Belgium. Um, later on that year when I would actually travel over to Belgium, I actually found that place and I'd never been there before. So that continued to verify to me this is something good to be involved with. But what was very significant about that particular dream was I could hear music in the sky. I could hear certain instruments, certain sounds, and it, was, it wasn't just um, like a drum beat, but it was the sound of, of other instruments, like I could hear a horn, I could hear a violin, and it was just this great, like a symphony literally in the sky. I contacted Timothy Corliss right after I had that dream, and I, I told him as much about it as I possibly could. When I was driving here to begin the rehearsals for the production, I was listening to a demo of what the music would be. And I think it was an act one, scene two. I was driving and I was listening to this and there is exactly a 30 second clip, which is exactly the music I heard in that dream. And it was very powerful to be able to hear that uh, just done so masterfully to kind of hear the sound that resonated in the sky that day kind of brought here to this physical place where everybody could hear it, not just me. To me, that was, um, that was a very powerful affirmation from the spirit that this is good work, this is necessary work, and that this is something which is truly for all people and that uh, we all need to have involvement in and that we all need to learn from. First off, we're a music festival, so the first priority for me, of course, would be to find the right composer to write the work, uh, a work that properly reflect the uh, power of the story of Francis Pegamagabo. And that led me to Tim Corliss, a wonderful composer who I knew before and a wonderfully deep spiritual composer. This is a collaborative work uh, that, from the very beginning, had a truth and reconciliation theme. The granting process uh, had this as part of its mandate, the new chapter grants. And also the organizers at the Festival of the Sound had the idea of a collaboration between the settler community in Perry Sound and the First Nations community in Perry Sound. So this is very much what happened. I do not know the theater world, so a friend of mine, Larry Beckwith, appeared. <laughs> and um, I asked him to co-coordinate this project with me and look after the theater part. I'm happy to consider turning out, but then I think that is... But then I become a kind of faceless, but no, at least... No, Larry, what you did worked. 
Okay. So having yeah. your voice as a yeah. amorphous thing, okay. where we don't even know it's you, okay. most people figure it out, but it, it works. I think Jim called me because I had brought a few projects up here over the years that involved uh, multimedia and uh, theatrical elements, and he certainly wanted this project to be uh, to have those elements as well. He found this wonderful writer, Armand Ruffo, lived from Queens, an Ojibwe from Queens, who, uh, of course, knew the story of Francis. And I contacted him. We had a very long conversation and a very powerful conversation. And by the end of that, he agreed to be part of the project submission. So one day I happened to check my mail, and lo and behold, there was a book. Uh, called Sound and Thunder, the stories of Francis Pickham Agabo by Dr. Brian McInnes. And uh, a couple days later, I received a call from the Festival of Sound asking me if I would like to write a script. Considering the serendipity of it all, I thought, hmm, this is something I'm, I'm meant to do. This led us, of course, to the research and to Dr. Brian McGuinness, the great-grandson of Francis Pegan Agabo, who, in fact, wrote a book about his great-grandfather, Sounding Thunder. And Brian has been invaluable in, as a resource and as a, as a as in consultation and helping through this whole, whole project. Uh, I, I think what was very significant for him, too, as well, uh, being an Ojibwe man, was the fact that the book focused a lot on who Francis was, uh, not just as a soldier, not just as someone of great military acclaim and accomplishment, but also as a community person, as a father, as uh, someone who cared very deeply about his people and the continuity of his traditions. Another collaborator that we worked with was Jennifer Kreisberg. Jennifer's role uh, is, is significant because I wanted to have a moment when this character that Armand wrote, um, which is the deer spirit, just releases emotion um, in, a, in a kind of just totally unbridled way, just like to sing from the heart. And um, there's really no other way to do this except to have, you know, a, a First Nations artist who could really do that. I really felt that it needed to be authentically Ojibwe at the beginning. Somehow it needed to feel um, like the old Ojibwe culture was represented, the traditional Ojibwe culture. So Tim approached me um, about any songs that we may have um, culturally appropriate for the beginning of the production. And as I thought about it, um, there wasn't really any songs that were appropriate. So I, I decided that I could probably come up with something and Tim let me run with it. And I came up with Wasoxing and Dion. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's a s stunning opening. And Wawate, who is playing the role of Francis, speaks the four directions after each stanza of the song. Wabanukwe, keeper of the east. The song emphasizes on the love of our home of Wasoxing and our community pride. 
And it's something that I have in common with Francis because we both love wassoxing. And I got that sense from hearing his story. And so I created this song just basically saying that we love our home and we are thankful to the Creator for everything that He's given us and that we're proud of where we're from. Keeper of the South. I finally figured out that the drum, the drum was like very important. And I, I heard this, you know, over and over again. Armand mentioned it. You know, a lot of times there was like one part that I'd written where I had the drum and other things happening. And Armand said, why not just the drum? And eventually, you know, we dropped that whole part and we did use just the drum. And, and Jody as well mentioned, you know, oh, the drum really helps. I like the drum. So I realized that the, the heartbeat of the drum is very important. In, in the music of, of Ojibwe culture and really resonates deeply with all of us. One of the challenges for me was to write a script that was not long, too long, so that there would, would be no room for the music. So I had to create a compelling dramatic arc while using historical information as much as possible to make it to make it accurate. So you can see how the text and the music have a, a very close relationship and there's, there's lots of opportunities for painting the text in the music and lots of ways in which the music uh, converses. I wanted them to really identify with the uh, trials and tribulations of Francis's life to identify what happened to him and his people. Judging from the audience response, uh, Tim and I managed to uh, pull it off. In my dream, I see a beautiful deer, head raised, nose up, ears twitching. I approach from upwind, but he turns to me and I realize this is meant to be. It is a spirit, a manitou in the in the, in the body of a deer. Every time he had to take a life, this is what Auntie Murr said to me, he would, it, it would t tear him apart because he knew he was taking that life, but yet at the same time, he was protecting our lives because he hadn't had family yet, and he was gonna have a family. And he didn't want that man coming over here. I know who you are. And so you do. I am your relative. Pegamagabo, caribou clan. And he came back, which is wonderful. A lot of them didn't come back. And I firmly believe it was who he was and what he believed in. And that's who I am today, too. I'm me, and I believe in what I believe in because of him. first performance took place on Wasoxing, which is the land where Francis came back to after the, after the First War, because we felt the premiere really should be on this island. It really should be where Francis lived and, and died. Before the um, bridge was in place, we used to take a ferry. We used to take a ferry to town. And it was even before the, uh, where South Point is. But this is where Grandpa would have left us. Really? Yeah, when he went to World War One, yeah, and, and this is where he would have come back. Yeah, because there was no, we did, there was no ferry or bridge back then, right? To live on in the hearts that we leave behind is not to die. I'm a firm believer in that. I am the granddaughter of Francis Peg McGobble and Eva Tranch, and also the granddaughter of Alfred Tababadum and Lucy Pomodjuan. They're both in my hearts. They will not die as long as I know I am. But we're all part of the community, right? So Uncle Fred is the only one that's alive now. And 
grandma is part of that Nanabush family. Um, so that's why when grandpa married grandma, they allowed them X amount of acreage to uh, build a house and raise their family. So that's how come we got, like my God was our Nanabush family. Yeah, that was where they first lived. Then it's just a little path up here, and uh, there's a clearing up there. Okay. So this is the area that they kind of cleared out. And there's uh, like uh, there's another little house up, up on top of the hill there. What happened to it? I don't know. When I come across it, I never expected to find anything like that. Duncan had cleared this area over here for the camping for they had ceremonies here and stuff like that. But yeah, this is a perfect hunting area. Perfect area to uh, get the animals to come because they can't come off that cliff. They have to come on around here and of course we're all waiting here for them. <laughs> Ani Bojo, it's hard to believe that a year ago we were meeting to have this this is very moving, very emotional, um, but it, it, tells, it tells the story, the truth, and we got to continue um, carrying on this reconciliation. Miigwech. Chimigwech, 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 Chimigwech. Beautiful, so beautiful. It was a show that was going to be about the right person at the right time and certainly in the right place. His destiny in life was to be a warrior and you know it was not easy for him. You know he was a very compassionate man. He had tremendous empathy for people and in his role as chief he saw this again and again as he in his later years um, this compassion emerged. Uh, quite a number of young First Nations men who've come up to me, you know, boys, uh, adolescents, and they've said Francis Pegamagabo is their hero. Any Anishinaabe that has done something extraordinary is always, to me, is, is uh, someone to look up to, and, and it's very important to have heroes because we don't have many. When I hear young Ojibwe men talking like that, uh, to me, that makes all of this absolutely worth it. Here is a story that does not end, but continues today in those who believe in a country where justice will prevail across our vast home and native land. For me, and, and seeing that this, this premiere um, is very heartwarming. Auntie Murr has dreamed of this for years of us all coming together and recognizing our grandfather. Uncle Duncan has driven that for us. I've waited a long time for this. Today, I am happy to be a Nishnabe. I am so happy. <laughs> happy tears. It's good to be an Indian today. Where?